When I was thinking about Palm Sunday, I was thinking back to when I was a child, and I didn't quite understand what Palm Sunday was about. I don't know if you were like me. I knew what Easter was about, and I knew I had to get to Palm Sunday in order to get to Easter. So yeah, I was really excited about Palm Sunday, because I knew that there was going to be a basket of eggs and candy waiting for me just a week later. And so today, I imagine, you know, I'm, I'm still like a little child inside in a lot of ways, and and I say to myself, you know, amongst the busyness of life and work and school and just family, and then you mix in all the different issues that we have and obstacles in life, I can get distracted, and I imagine you too can get distracted from what is really Palm Sunday all about. And if you've grown up in the church, it can be just something that you just automatically do. You automatically celebrate. You know, maybe, maybe today's a day where maybe you know, you sprayed on a little bit more perfume or wore, you know, a certain outfit. But that's one of the things that I want to talk about today is what is the significance of Palm Sunday? Because I think that if we really understood, if we were reminded of the significance of Palm Sunday, not only is it going to revolutionize just our faith, it's going to prepare our hearts, if you will, for this week that's coming up ahead. So that when we do arrive on Easter, that all of a sudden, the pieces of the puzzle, if you will, the dots on the page start to really connect. And so today we're going to be looking at the significance of Palm Sunday. And what I invite all of us to do is not to be spectators in all of this. As much as it is possible, I want us to immerse ourselves into the story which we know some of the characters of the story. We know some of the features. Possibly we've heard about the donkey. We've heard about the waving of the palm branches. We, we understand that Jesus was the one, this, this figure on this donkey. But, but what does all of those things really mean? What does it really represent? We just sang the song, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. What does that word mean? Why do we sing that? And so today I invite all of us, myself included, to just immerse ourselves into this story on a hillside, somewhere miles away from an ancient city called Jerusalem, where there's this long journey through an arid region, beautiful hues of color in the sky, and we see that there is this mysterious figure, this man who people call the Son of Man. The Son of God, his name is Jesus, and his followers, his disciples, 12 unscrupulous men who were from all different backgrounds, that didn't have it all together, people like you and like me, who were just following him in faith, putting their trust in this man who seemed to have the answers that their hungry souls were craving. And I want you to imagine, I want you to picture that you are one of those people who are in that crowd today, following him, following the one that holds, that holds the answers to the holes in our heart. That is who these men were following, and that is who we are following. And so we're invited into this story today, and as we do, there's going to be certain themes that are going to pop out off the page. Certain themes that we're going to be discussing that when we think about Palm Sunday, they're going to be a reflection not only on this particular day, but on every day. On every day of our lives as we journey through the long journey till we get to our final destination, back into the arms of the Lord. And those themes are going to be humility, they're going to be peace, we're going to be talking about surrender today. Surrender. And these, these adjectives, these themes, they become sort of a guiding light for us to live this life and also the life that is to come. And we're going to talk that they're going to be somewhat of a foreshadowing of what life is really like. So I invite you to open up the Bibles that you have in your hand. Under the seat we have some Bibles. You might have your phone. The verses will be also on the screen, but this is the 
This is the journey that many of the Gospels speak about. This journey, this triumphant entry, if you will, of Jesus into Jerusalem. We read about it in Matthew. We read it about it in Luke. Today we're going to look at Mark's account. So open up to Mark chapter 11. So Mark chapter 11, we're going to be reading the first 11 verses together. And what I want us to discover, what, what I believe that holds in this ancient text about this sacred day, are going to be two movements, two underlying themes. We're going to be looking at both the preparation and the proclamation of our faith. And I'm going to unpack that for us and what that actually means. But to summarize what Palm Sunday symbolizes is in fact that is that Palm Sunday symbolizes both the preparation and the proclamation of our faith in Jesus. As we enter the journey into Easter Sunday, we are going to look at Palm Sunday as a way to prepare our hearts for the proclamation of the good news that is about to come. And as we enter into Holy Week, isn't that what we want to do? We want to prepare our hearts for Easter Sunday. Now, we don't want to do that just on one day out of the year, but we want a lifestyle of this. And Palm Sunday again gives us that. So let's look at the preparation that Palm Sunday symbolizes. So as we read here in the text, Mark chapter 11, verse 1. Now, when they drew near to Jerusalem, to Bethpage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples and he said to them, Go into the village in front of you, and immediately as you enter it, you will find a colt tied on which no one has ever sat. Untie it and bring it. If anyone says to you, why are you doing this? Say, the Lord has need of it, and send it back here immediately. And they went away and they found it. They found a colt tied at a door outside in the street, and they untied it. I just want to pause there for a minute. So I'll give you a little bit of background and, and, and just kind of fill in some of the blanks here as to what's happening in the scene. You know, we just read that as they were walking through a village, Bethany and Bethpage, which were miles away from their destination. What was that destination? It was Jerusalem, that ancient city where God's temple resided. And so as they're making their way, Jesus, he's speaking to his disciples. He's speaking to the 12 that were with them. They approach the city, Bethany and Bethpage. Bethpage, which name means house of unripe figs. As almost as if there was, it was not ready yet. Right? There was an unripeness. There was sort of a, you know, there was sort of this idea that things were not yet as they meant to be. And so they pass through Bethpage. They pass through Bethany. Bethany is a city we read about in other parts of the Bible. This is a town where Mary, where Martha and Lazarus were from. We read about that earlier, especially in the book of Matthew. Now, these cities were a long journey to Jerusalem. And Jesus, he's there and he, he calls out to them and he says to them, he says, go to the village ahead of you just as you enter it, and you're going to find a cult there. You're going to find a cult there. Now, the reason why I chose Mark's gospel account is he has a few more details to add. And so one of the things that we read here is that there's a young cult, a young donkey that is tied up. Now, this is significant. I don't want us to go past this. So this is significant in a lot of ways. Now, first of all, one of the, one of the details that Mark leaves out that shows up in Matthew if we jump to what Matthew says about it, is that in the book of Matthew, he says that they brought a donkey and a colt. A donkey and a colt. And so in Matthew chapter 21, verse 7, we hear this little extra detail. It's significant for many ways. One of the ways it's significant, first of all, we need to understand Matthew, the gospel of Matthew, and the audience that he's speaking to, which is a mostly Jewish audience. And so when you read Matthew, you get a little bit more insight, you get a little bit more of those cultural references, 
and he includes a lot more of Old Testament scripture in his writings because, again, he's speaking to a Jewish audience. And so why is that significant? Well, it really all boils back to a prophecy that was spoken 500 years before this moment in time where Jesus is walking through Bethany, walking through Bethpage. And we read about it in Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9. And Zechariah the prophet, he announces, he proclaims, he says, Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Shout, daughter Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you, righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey and a colt, the foal of a donkey. This is a prophecy that was spoken about the future coming Messiah, the future coming Deliverer, who is going to deliver God's people. And we read about this 500 years early, that he would be lowly, that he would be humble, and that he would come riding on both a donkey, on a colt. And so here we are in Mark's account, and we read that this prophecy, Jesus himself is proclaiming this. And this this prophecy speaks to a divinity that sort of underlined this whole thing, because how would Jesus have known this? Yes, Jesus may have been familiar with Zechariah 9.9, but how would he know? And that's where we're about to step into next. If we go back to Mark and we read what happens next. So these, these disciples, they, they go on in verse 4, and, he's, and they went and they found the cult outside the street. Look at what he says. He says, First of all, he says, if anyone says to you when you go to this village, why are you doing this? Why are you untying this coat and bringing it to me? The Lord, say this, the Lord has need of it and will send it back here immediately. And they went away and they found a cult. They found a cult tied at a door outside in the street and they untied it. In verse 7, you can go to the next slide. He says, once again, the master comes out, the master of the cult, and he says, he says here, I love what he says, he says, they went out, they found the cult in the street, they tied it to a doorway, and the, and the person, the owner says, why are you doing this? Why are you untying the cult? And just as Jesus had proclaimed, they repeated back to him what he had said, because my master needs it. And what did he do here in the text? It says that, he released the cult. He released the cult. So there's this idea that there's that that this ma- that this owner, this master of the cult, had had submitted. He he understood what they meant when he said master. That that master was also Lord. That 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 speaks to God's divinity. So sometimes when we hear about this story on Palm Sunday, we think about and we picture this donkey, this this humble animal, and. And it's so cool how Jesus just knew about it, and he was there, and he brought it to him. But what we forget is that this is fulfilling a prophecy about God delivering his people that was spoken 500 years earlier. That for 500 years, God's people had been waiting for this moment to arrive. 500 years, they were waiting for their deliverer to come. Now, one of the things that stands apart from all of this is that their deliverer didn't come on a wild horse with full armor, flailing a sword in hand. That is what we think of when we think about a mighty deliverer who comes to rescue, to save the day. That's what I think about. The knight in shining armor who's going to come and rescue a nation. But instead, Jesus, he comes riding on the most lowly of animals that was not well respected, on an animal, on on a young animal at that. And he uses that as his entrance statement. He uses a humble, lonely, young animal with no reputation to be his entrance statement. And he does this for many reasons. One is it speaks to the character of Jesus. It speaks to his humility. It speaks to the fact that he was not looking for fanfare, but that 
that he was embodying the characteristics of the kingdom of God, that, that humility is what the kingdom of God is after, but also speaks to peace. You see, because a cult, unlike a wild stallion, embodies peace. And God, he, he comes and he ushers in his kingdom to create peace, to create peace. But unlike, again, the deliverer that they were waiting for, the peace that he was trying to create was not peace among nations, but peace between you and him. Peace between God and his children. And so the peace that he is going to, going to create, that he desires to create, is that restored relationship which has been fractured by sin. And we live in this world of brokenness. We live in this world of, of, of sin that has been original from, from the beginning of time. We can see it around us. That is what is preventing us from entering into a relationship with the Holy God. And so when he comes, he's come with the intent to create peace. And finally, by coming on a donkey, by coming on the most humble of animals, the most young and vulnerable, what he's doing is he's defying expectations. Again, the, the Jewish people, they were imagining this heroic figure on a wild stallion, but yet they got this peaceful, humble man who was riding on a donkey. And so what Jesus is coming to say and articulate is, is that he comes to defy our expectations. In fact, our expectations of him will always be defied because they don't make sense. They don't make sense to us in our natural mind. They don't make sense to us in what we elevate to be good and to be wise and to be powerful in this world. He's everything opposite of that. And that's why Palm Sunday is just another one of those holidays, those moments where we are reminded that we serve a God who defies expectation. We serve a God who defies what we, the expectations not only the world places on him, but also what we place upon him. The limitations that we think that, that he has, that we, he can do. When we look at our circumstances in our life, when we look at those hard things, those broken things, those things that look like they are too far gone, we are reminded that the King of kings, the Lord of lords, he looks and looks at it the same way. He can, he can do exceedingly abundantly more than we could ever ask, hope, or imagine. But the fourth thing that Jesus walking, riding into Jerusalem on a donkey represents, and as we see here in the text, is his kingship. It's finally his kingship. We see this showing up in the next verse as they brought the cult to Jesus. And they went ahead. And I love what Mark says. It says here that they brought him a cult. They brought him a cult in which no one had ever sat. That is a detail that we could unpack for a whole sermon in and of itself. But the fact that Jesus sat on a cult that no one had sat meant that this cult was preserved. And it speaks to the purity of Jesus. It speaks to how he alone is the only one worthy. And again, it speaks to his lordship. It speaks to his kingship. And when we read through the text, and we see that he comes riding, they all shout, they all throw their cloaks on the road, and, and they, they wave these palm branches. They wave these palm branches back and forth. And these palm branches, they represent joy in the ancient days. They represent salvation in the ancient days. And so they're shouting and they're singing. And what do they sing? Hosanna! Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna! Blessed he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest. That song alone means so many things. Hosanna, save us now. Save us now, Jesus, save us now. When we cry Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest, we are declaring, we are, we are calling upon heaven to save us. In your prayer time with the Lord, in the moment of your affliction, you can cry Hosanna. 
You don't have to wait until Palm Sunday to cry, Hosanna. You can call on the name of the Lord and say, Jesus, save me now. Save me now in this moment that I find myself in. And the disciples, they say, blessed he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed he who is coming, the kingdom of our father, David. Now that speaks all the way back again to Old Testament, 2 Samuel. Again, where it talks about the coming kingdom, where finally God would send a Messiah and he would rescue God's people from their sins. And it says this, when your days are over, he's speaking to David, David on his deathbed, at the end of his life, God is speaking. And he says, when your days are over and you rest with your ancestors, I will raise you up. I will raise up your offspring to succeed you, your own flesh and blood, and I will establish you, your kingdom. He is the one who will build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father, and he will be my son. And so when we cry, Hosanna, when the disciples were, were, were crying, Hosanna, the coming kingdom of our father, David, again, they're proclaiming God's deity. They're proclaiming Jesus' deity as God himself, as the fulfillment of this passage that was spoken hundreds of years earlier. They knew something that maybe the onlookers didn't know. Hosanna in the highest heaven. And so when we read the account of, of the first Palm Sunday, we discover the humility of the kingdom. We discover the message of peace that it brings. The significance of the kingship of God, revealing his identity as the true king, the true messiah. And finally, that we allow this first Palm Sunday to realize that it defies all of our expectations about what life looks like in the kingdom of God. So what can we do with this information today? What can this first account of Palm Sunday do for our lives today? Well, I think that there's a few things that it can do for us, that it can help to, to reframe and prepare our hearts for Easter. So one is that allows it to defy our expectations. Allow Palm Sunday to defy our expectations. What expectations do you have about God? We all have expectations, and it's not wrong to have expectations. And when we have expectations, we either can have them met or unmet. Some people believe they don't have any expectations and don't want any expectations because then, then there's no risk of being disappointed. But in our heart of hearts, we always have an expectation and there's voices that are around us that shape those expectations, even subtly. Even when I don't want to have expectations because I want to guard myself and I don't want to be disappointed. There's voices that are around me that are speaking that form expectations. And so for us today on this first Palm Sunday, what we need to be reminded is that we need to allow the truth of God's word to set our expectations. That the expectations we can have, we can have expectations, but all of our expectations need to be rooted in God's word. Because everything that God says, everything that God does, every promise of God is yes and amen according to scripture. He is not a man that he should lie. And so if he is going to make that promise, then we are going to be founded on his promises, amen? We've been lied to and we've been led astray by the voices in our own minds, the voices of the enemy and the voices of our culture, which say that if God really loved you, then things would not, nothing bad would ever happen. We've allowed the expectation of good circumstances, the lack of trials, to define God's love for us. But yet what the Easter story reminds us is that Jesus was a man of suffering. Jesus was a man who, in a few days from now, we are going to be honoring Good Friday. 
And we reminded on that day that because of his great love for us, for you, for me, he suffered. And in the same way that he suffered, we suffer. But we have an honor of suffering in that way when we lay down our lives for each other in humility. And so allowing the expectations, opening up our minds, if we're struggling today, if we're maybe feeling far from God today, just maybe allowing the expectations that we've held on to, just let go, just loosen the grip a little bit, and allowing Palm Sunday to defy our own expectations. The second thing that this text and Palm Sunday allows us and reinforces for us is that we are to embody humility, just like Jesus. Jesus is our model. He came down from heaven to enter into this life, yes, to save us from our sins, but he also came to embody the characteristics of the kingdom of God so that we would know what it would look like to be his followers, that we would understand somewhat of the core values of the kingdom of God. And so with that, when we see this story of this king of kings, lord of lords, coming into Jerusalem on a donkey that no one had ever sat upon, we are reminded of the humility, of the peace, and the joy that we have with God, number one, but then in our relationships with each other. So when I think about and I assess those relationships that I have in my life, I say, am I embodying humility? Am I embodying peace? Am I seeking peace between that person and myself? Am I embodying joy? Joy in my relationship with God? You know, these are, these are all sort of vertical first and then horizontal. We can't live out horizontally what we haven't received vertically. And so when we first have a relationship which is humble and peaceful and joyful with the Lord, we will automatically, by extension, be humble and peaceful and joyful with each other. And the third thing that we can apply to our lives today in the story and the reaccount of Palm Sunday is that we are to embrace. We're to embrace the kingship of Christ. Just like those early followers who are waving those palm branches, who are waving those palm branches and singing, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest, Hosanna, the kingdom of David, and recalling how God was going to raise up a seed out of the kingdom of David, one day being the mighty deliverer, we recognize that Jesus is who he says he is. He has been the fulfillment of Scripture. We read about it in Zechariah. We read it about it in 2 Samuel. That, in fact, the entire biblical account from Genesis to Revelation speaks about Jesus. And here, this triumphal entry is, why is it so triumphant? Is because the king has finally arrived. For hundreds of years, Scripture have been talking about this, this day finally happening. Jesus, he spent three and a half years on earth doing ministry, and many times he would tell his followers, don't say who I am. Don't tell them about the miracle that I performed for you. The time wasn't ready. It wasn't right for him to make his public declaration. Perhaps that's why he went through Bethpage about the, the city of unripe figs. It wasn't yet ready. But now, now is the time where Jesus, he comes and he announces who he is for all to see, unabashedly so. This is his moment. And again, he comes out on a humble donkey. He comes out on a humble, young, vulnerable animal, and he announces his kingship. So when we think about this in our own lives, we think about this idea that if he is who he says he is, if all of Scripture has been pointing to Jesus this whole time, that he is the Son of God, that he is the Savior, how can I surrender to him? He is the King. He is the Lord, not only of everyone of the world, but he is the Lord of my life. And have I made him the Lord of my life? 
are the things in my life that I am holding back from Jesus. Does he have all of me? Or just does he have some of me? Does he only have me on Sunday? Or does he have me Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday? Does he have me? Does he have me when I'm alone at home? Does he have me when I'm in the car? Does he have me when I'm with my family? Does he have me when I'm staring at the screen? Does he have me? The Palm Sunday story, it begs us to say, who are we serving? And again, it defies our expectations of who Jesus is and what he came to do. But no less the King of kings and the Lord of lords. This is the king who we serve. And Palm Sunday symbolizes both the preparation of our hearts, but the proclamation of our faith that we serve a Savior who is humble, who is loving, who came to create peace among us, and who has. And when we head into this week and we head towards Good Friday, we can exclaim, we can proclaim that who entered Jerusalem in the most humble and peaceful and loving way, is the same one who went to a cross on Friday in the most humble and peaceful way to create peace where there was no peace. And one of the things, and I want to close with this, that Palm Sunday gives us, is it gives us a depiction of what God's kingdom is going to look like. Not only God's kingdom here and now, because we do have it in part. Jesus came. He sent his Holy Spirit to dwell among us. And God is here. But also what the kingdom of God is going to look like when he comes. And again, he speaks about this from Genesis to Revelation. But God's kingdom is going to be full of humility and peace and joy. That it's going to be unassuming. That we, even whatever expectations we have about heaven and what it's going to look like, we need to open our minds to believe that it may not be what we think it is, but that is what scripture tells us it's going to be. And I can tell you if I flip all the way to the end of the book, it's gonna say that it's gonna be filled with people of every tribe and every tongue and every nation. And they're all gonna be what? Praising God and waving palm branches, celebrating, singing, Hosanna in the highest. And so when I, when we think about Palm Sunday, what I want us to think about is that it's a foreshadowing of God's kingdom when he comes back to get us and take us to be where he is. That in the same picture of Jesus being up, elevated high, humble, joyful, that his people are going to be gathered around him, waving palm branches, symbols of joy, symbols of peace, symbols of salvation of every tribe and every tongue and every nation. That is what the depiction of heaven. And that is what Palm Sunday means. And so now, here I stand as a, as a grown man, and I think back to those days of Palm Sunday, going to my grandmother's house for lasagna. Mm. <laughs> Not really sure why I was there, why I was wearing white pants and a white shirt and a white jacket, but that's what my mother put me in. Not really too sure. But now... Now I recognize that Palm Sunday symbolizes the preparation and the proclamation of my faith. And that I can live today knowing that in the same way that Jesus entered and he entered into Jerusalem is the same way that he's going to return. And it's the same way that heaven is going to be like for us. So Lord, let, us, let that fill you today with, with peace and with joy and with hopeful expectation. That Jesus, Hosanna, the mighty deliverer, that he is making a way and has already made a way. And if you've never received Christ as your Savior, if you're on the fringe of saying, you know what, I, I've heard of this and I, I'm not sure I believe it yet. Let us remember that Palm Sunday, Palm Sunday is about defining expectation. Possibly. Possibly there's some expectations that Jesus wants us, wants to defy in us. But for those of us that have, and that have been filled with his Holy Spirit, because that is the promise, that when he comes, he's going to fill us with his Holy Spirit. 
That when we put our faith and our trust in him, he fills us with, this, with his spirit to enable us. And so for us, we can embody these principles in our relationships with each other. We can embody humility, peace, and joy. And lastly, seeing God's kingdom, seeing Palm Sunday as a way to embrace Christ as king in our life. What is it today that you have not given? What area of your life have you not given to Christ that he can be Lord over? Let that be a reflection in your heart and in your mind, knowing that whatever you give to him is for your good, it's for your flourishing, that whatever you seemingly feel like you have to give up that seems to mean so much to you, you are going to receive a hundred, a thousand, a millionfold in return. The peace and the joy that maybe that thing, that, that thing in your life that hasn't been given you, it can be found when you finally release it back to him. So let those reflections today be with you as well as this week as we journey to Easter together. Let us pray.